Good morning. We've been we're going through Paul's letter to the Corinthians. In the section we'll see this morning, Paul will describe himself as God's ambassador. Well, he is God's ambassador to the Gentiles. Gentiles are non-Jews, and that describes most, if not all of us, we're Gentiles. And so God gave Paul a message to pass on to us. I'm going to try, I'm going to try something. I'm going to speak a message. I want you to go to Jennifer, and you're going to whisper it in Jennifer's ear, and it's going to go down that row, and right there, and you whisper it over into her ear. So we'll get that, and it's going to end up at Chuck. And so let's see if the message we start with is the message we end up with. So you only get to say it, you whisper it in their ear once, and then you've got to pass on what you think you heard. Does that make sense? Okay. Here it is. So you whisper that. <laughs> no, can't peek at it. <laughs> it's a lot. Is it? Is it a lot of words? Is, okay, give it a try. Just the best that you can. Chuck, would you come up here? <laughs> okay, I'm going to have Chuck kind of lean in so he can use my... So, this is Chuck. Chuck, what is the message that you believe you heard? The gospel and the Gentiles were together for a while. <laughs> That's not... You know what? That's not too bad. It's <laughs> The gospel and the Gentiles were together for a while. You know, and then they split up. And then... the, the original message was... Through the Gospels, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. <laughs> but it was just for a while. Um, things get lost in the translation. And Paul talks about the message he received. It's about a couple millennia ago. And as we understand it, we'll be able to determine how well it has been passed on over the past two millennia. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Thanks for doing that, folks. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me... It is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes. Who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. <laughs> 
For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? And if then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings. And would that you did reign, so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. And we labor working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you, then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you, Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with a spirit of gentleness? Paul describes himself two ways. If you, he gives us a job description. He sees himself as a servant of Christ and as a steward of mysteries. Let's take those in order. Servant of Christ. We'll talk about that at the end of this chapter. And Steward of mysteries, we'll catch that later. He talks himself as a servant of Christ. A servant is an assistant. An assistant is one who receives orders or directions. Paul sees himself as a subordinate, bound to obey. Now, a subordinate, this kind of person is not a slave, uh, but labors as a free person. They don't have to do this, but they choose to. Paul sees himself as one who learns his task and goal from another who is over him. So the thing about a servant, he does what he's told to do. Paul talks about being a servant of Christ. The Corinthians were anxious to claim the benefits of spiritual authority. They wanted to be understood and seen as spiritual authorities, as spiritual guides. And Paul talks to them about what it meant for him to be a servant of Christ. He reveals how he has been treated. And again, I'm going to read, begin in verse 9. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake. But you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We're poorly dressed, buffeted, and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still, like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Paul details life as an apostle, as a servant of Christ. Being last of all refers to social rank at the end of the line. Being sentenced to death and a spectacle to the world probably draws on images of Roman triumphs in which the Roman, the conquering Roman general was seated in a chariot and the conquered people were arrayed behind him, led in 
triumphal procession. They were the defeated soldiers. And what they did, they were dragged or marched through the city in a parade and executed at its end. And when Paul talks about who he is, he is one of those who follows in triumphal procession these conquered people who are reviled and spit at. Being buffeted refers to being struck like a slave. The blows are not offered, they are offered as insults. And usually with verbal abuse, being homeless identifies them as wanderers. Working with our own hands implies exhausting labor. And Paul filled the niche. Corinth was a city that was uh, you could do business, and so he made tents. And these tents were used by the Roman army, probably. He had a market for them, and so this is what he did in order that he might be able to bring the message without having to depend on the Corinthians. Uh, like their Lord, Paul goes on, apostles are objects of contempt. Scum refers to what is removed by cleaning. So something that dirty that you clean, scum is what you end up with. Uh, refuse refers to the scrapings that are scrubbed off something. If you, if you walk through mud and you're cleaning your boots, that's the idea of refuse is what you scrape off of your boots. Um, and that's the way Paul describes himself and those who were his uh, direct charges. Though apostles are reviled, persecuted, and slandered, Paul writes, they respond as Christ did with blessing and endurance. So well, that's being a servant of Christ and far from giving them crowns to where God determined that apostles and servants should suffer like Christ and be indistinguishable from the abject poor. Do you know what the Corinthians' problem was? They identified themselves with the risen Christ but they forgot that before he was the risen Christ, he was the suffering servant and the crucified son. They wanted to join him in his resurrection without going through the things he went through to get to the point of resurrection. Um, Paul talks about being a servant of Christ, and he also talks about then being a steward of mysteries. Um, stewards are chief household slaves. It's an important thing to understand. What happened? The owner of a house, would, it would be the owner of the house, and then there was the steward, and then there were the servants. And the owner of the house would have goods and services that he would provide for the servants. He wouldn't give these things to the servants directly. The Lord of the house would give it to the steward of the house to disperse to the servants in the house. And that's what the steward did. Took things from the owner, made them available to the servants. That was his job. Um, they administer the goods, understanding that they will give an account for their faithfulness. Now, you can imagine that there were some, and there were some, who took the things given to them and just kind of tucked a little bit away and then passed on the rest. What happens with stewards, they are held accountable to pass on directly as dictated to the things the Lord needed to give the servants. And if the servants were shorted, by the steward. The steward was held accountable. Um, this is how Paul understood himself, that he received things from God, from Christ, and passed these things on to individuals. Uh, Jesus talked to his disciples about the responsibility and accountability. I'm going to read you this story. It's a little bit lengthy. Um, Jesus tells this. He's gathered with his disciples. He says, be dressed and ready for service. Keep your lamps burning. 
It's in Luke chapter 12, verse 35. Keep your lamps burning like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth. He will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. So you must also must be ready. Because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. When he's talking about this, he is a little bit nervous, maybe, confused. He asks a really good question. Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? Is what you're describing something for us in particular or for all those who follow you in general? And Jesus lets him know by his answer that it's not written to everyone, that the apostles were those who received things from Jesus. They were tasked to turn and give those things to the servants. And that was a grave responsibility. And so Jesus answers the question. The Lord answered, Who then is the faithful and wise manager or steward whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? What Jesus is describing, Peter says, are you telling this to everyone or just to us? And what, what Jesus says, no, I'm not talking about servants. I'm talking about stewards. Those to whom I give things to give to servants. I'm talking about them in particular. And he goes on. It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth. He will put him in charge of all his possessions. That's the good news. goes on, but suppose the servant says to himself, my master is taking a long time in coming. And he then begins to beat the men servants and maid servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he is not aware of. Strong language. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with unbelievers. That servant who knows his master's will and does not get ready or does not do what his master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. You know what Jesus is indicating? Those who he tasks to be stewards have a responsibility and accountability. He's not talking about Christians in general, but those who have been given something to give to his people. Um, stewards have a great responsibility and accountability. They are responsible to pass on the message they have received. Okay, what do God's stewards disperse? What are they supposed to give? What is it that the master gives the steward that the steward is supposed to give to the servants? That's a good question, isn't it? It's, it's a, yeah. What he says? The mysteries of God. We are stewards of the mysteries of God. So you know what's supposed to happen? Jesus talks about mysteries to stewards. Stewards are supposed to pass these mysteries on. And we'll talk about what those are because that's what he gives to his servants. And if something ends up getting clogged on the way through, sometimes the message ends up getting changed a little bit. 
Um, a mystery, just so you know, it's a secret. It's something intentionally hidden purposefully concealed. When we think of ministry, mystery, we think of something hard to unravel. There's good mysteries. I like a mystery. You have to figure out, what's, I wonder what's going to happen. And a mystery in our time, it's difficult to discover. You know, some of the best movies are those movies that you never saw it coming, like The Sixth Sense with Bruce Willis, the one where he already dies. And you, Oh, I, I gave away the ending, if you've never seen <laughs> But it's, it just, you didn't see it coming. Um, when the Bible uses the term, a mystery is not something difficult to discover. It's impossible to discover until it's revealed. Impossible. You're not going to figure it out. If God doesn't tell somebody who tells somebody else, you're not going to figure it out. And that's what Paul sees himself as a steward of mysteries. What's the mystery? Um, it says it in your sheet, your worship folder. Seems pretty straightforward. The mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. What Jesus told Paul, Gentiles are in. Discrimination is out. Share that. And Paul shared that. And he shared it with Gentiles. And they thought it was pretty good news. And he shared it with Jews as well. And at the time, as it's fitting, they had some issues. Um, this is a big statement because the mystery then has to do with God himself. If you look at the Old Testament, again, I'm, gonna, I'm picking my words carefully. From Mount Sinai, racism was sanctioned. If you were a Jew, you were in. If you're not a Jew, According to the Old Testament, you are out. You have no way in. And you'd say, oh, no, that's no, no, this is what Paul says. In Ephesians 2, 11 through 13, here's what Paul says. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh prior to Christ's coming were at that time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise. Here's what he says. Having no hope and without God in the world, relative to the Old Testament documents, if you're a Gentile, you have no chance of being one of God's children. That's what Paul is saying. And then he goes on, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. At the end, we're going to celebrate communion. And what communion kind of like represents for us is an open door into the people of God, a door that was not opened in the Old Testament. Um, God's nature, then, is veiled in the Old Testament purposefully. The racism, genocide that are associated with God's proclamations are not reflective of what he is like. We read things in the Old Testament. We say, how in the world can that be here? God is deliberately cloaking, veiling, so it appears that he is one way, but he is not. God does not sanction discrimination based on gender, race, or class. It's not what he's like. But you say, Mike, it, it's in the Old Testament. The Old Testament veils purposefully. The Old Testament is mystery. Does that make sense? Purposefully veil God's character is to be brought into the light when Jesus comes. Uh, we can look at things in the Old Testament and make assessments of God that are wrong. Because the Old Testament documents are purposefully veiled. God's Nature is veiled in the Old Testament. God's nature is unveiled in the New Testament. 
And Paul's message is to Gentiles, you're in, you're in, you're in, you're in, you're in. You weren't in prior to Christ, just so you're clear. If Jesus hadn't come, we would still be without hope and without God in the world. Um, to Paul called the message of the cross the message of reconciliation. Paul's message, Jay referenced it, at the time that God was opening his arms to, and if, at this point when Paul existed, we were them. We, Gentiles, were them. And that's what Paul's message was. To everyone who would listen, God is opening his arms to them. He wasn't very popular for bringing that message. He was among some groups, but he was hated by others. And he didn't change the message because he was a steward. Responsible to take something and to give what had been taken, Paul would not change the message. Because stewards take what's given to them and pass it on in its fullness. And that's the way Paul saw himself. To change one iota the message that he was given would be unthinkable to him. He was a steward. What he writes, with me, in verse 3, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. It's the Lord who judges me. You know what he's saying? He said, ultimately, when Paul was around and people said, Paul, you're full of it. And what Paul would say, I'm not your steward. So ultimately, I'm not going to I'm not going to consider how I'm doing based on what you say. He is the one who gave me the message, and therefore, I'm going to have to wait for what he says. He um, says, therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and will disclose the purposes of the heart. You know what he's saying? When Jesus comes a second time, He's going to declare what the original message was. It's like what we did here. I spoke something, and by the time it got around, it wasn't exactly, you guys did pretty well, actually. <laughs> it wasn't exactly the same. That's what it's, when it says he will expose the motives of men's hearts, I don't think it's talking about servants. I think it's talking about stewards. A steward who takes the message and changes it, maybe in order to not be considered as, I don't know, why would a steward change the message? I don't know. At any rate, what's going to happen? Jesus is going to proclaim this was the original message. And then it will become clear Again, I don't know how this all works, but a steward who takes something and shifts it, doesn't proclaim the message, faithfulness wasn't the most important thing to that steward, was it? Do you understand what I'm saying? Faithfulness was not the most important thing. So you get to know the motives because if he had really wanted to be a steward and considered faithfulness as a priority, he would have said what he heard. But that's what's going to happen when Jesus comes back. Um, he says, therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time. And by the way, we really are not in a position to determine how healthy or unhealthy churches are. We don't know. There's some big churches that probably won't do well, some small churches that won't do well, some big, you know, it's not really about how many people or how many programs. Or the giving. It's about, is the message being proclaimed? Because that's the thing that Jesus gives to those who are supposed to give it out. Is the message being proclaimed? How accurately? How carefully? 
That is the, the treasure that he gives us. Uh, Paul's point is that when the message is declared by Christ, the motives of stewards and servants will become clear. This is the accountability Paul talks about here. Paul is very direct in his revelation of this, but he's gentle as well. He says, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. You know what? He doesn't call anybody out by name. What he does, he applies it to himself and Apollos so that they will see from this example how they should regard those who were their leaders. And so as you consider Paul and Apollos, Paul would say, consider those who are being puffed up and arrogant. Um, he goes on, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. When he talks about guides, you know what he really says here? You have 10,000. You have 10,000 guides. Guides were tutors. If you were in a wealthy Roman family, you had kids. Your child wasn't a, an heir. He wasn't considered one who was a real member of your household until age 18 or 25. What happened up until age 18, your child, if you had wealth as a Roman, would have been under the control of what's called a guide or a tutor, a paedagogos. And so what the paedagogos did is they took the kids from the home to the school and made sure they got there. A paedagogos is pictured in Greek vases with having a stick in his hand, a rod. So what the guy did, if your kid, so you know that this guy is going to get your kid to school. You know, the kid goes, I don't think I want to go to school. Whack! Yes, you are. Okay. You know, I think I know. I think I want to whack. Oh, okay. And he was treated no better than a slave. This is what the paedagogos, this is what the guy did. He made sure your kid got to school. Uh, in Greek plays, he was often portrayed as kind of stupid, harsh, always with a stick in his hand. And uh, what ended up happening was when your child came of age, the father would dismiss the tutor, the guide, the paedagogos. And he then would become personally involved in teaching and relating to his son. Um, here's what Paul draws a contrast in the Bible between guides and the father. It says, so then the law was our guardian until Christ came. You know what guardian means? Pedagogos. Don't commit adultery. Smack! Keep holy the Lord's day. Smack! Don't steal. Smack! That's the purpose of the law. The law functions as those paedagogoi functioned, as the tutors functioned, as the guides functioned. Before the father comes onto the scene, this, they have a role, and they are intentionally harsh and severe. When he says the law... The law was what carried a stick. And it says the law was our guardian until Christ came. Until Christ came. And then it says, um, in order that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Is God looking at your life Determining how faithful you have been in keeping the Ten Commandments. No. That's what we're supposed to be saying. That's what we're supposed to be saying. The commandments had their place. Their place ended when Christ came. And there are many places that still 
lay on top of people the burden of keep the commandments and you'll be blessed. Don't keep the commandments and you'll be cursed. Now, is the truth? Yeah, but see, what ends up happening, what we'll experience in communion, what, what, this is, what Christianity is all about, it's about the coming of age. To step out from under the tutelage of something with a stick into the arms of a father who doesn't use a stick. That's what we're supposed to be saying. And it's not said, or oftentimes not said. God loves you, but. God loves you, but. Paul's point. is that they don't need to be punched in the nose by tutors. Neither do you. You know what you need? You need to understand God doesn't carry a stick. God would be your father. That's what you're supposed to know. That's what you're supposed to be told. Um, Paul writes, and he wasn't a weak, Paul was really gentle, but when it came to the interest of sheep, if there were wolves, Paul was aggressive and assertive. He says, I will come to you soon if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. In Texas, there's an, in, in Texas, there's an idiom. He calls, and they talk about people as all hat, no cattle. <laughs> And so Paul is saying that when he visits them, if these people are all hat and no cattle, they're going to they're gonna deal with somebody who has some power. Paul was deadly serious about the gospel. Really. In fact, what we're going to find next week is that somebody ends up involved in some kind of incest, and Paul is angry about it. And he rebukes this church, but he's not nearly as angry as he was in, in Galatia where someone took the message of the gospel and shifted it. They said, God loves you, and he'll love you even more if you... And you know what Paul said about that person? In fact, they were saying that you still need to be circumcised, and, and Paul ends up saying, <laughs> okay, if you're going to be at it, just don't stop with the foreskin. Just get the whole business in whack, you know? So, ooh. <laughs> And you know why he was upset? Because somebody was changing the message. And he goes, you don't change the message. Ultimately, you know what he says to the Galatians? They, when they understood the message, there was love. And when somebody adjusted the message a little bit, God loves you and he'll love you even more if you give more than 10%. God loves you and he'll love you even more if you memorize more Bible verses. Go to church more. Again, go to church. Read the Bible. Do that. But don't do that because you're going to make God love you more. God cannot love you more because God's love for you is the same as his love for his son. If you are in Christ, God loves God's love for you is the same as his love for his son. You can't increase that. That's what you're supposed to be told. That's the message that is supposed to be communicated. Um, it's important to get the message right. I'm going to read a verse. It's, this is in Isaiah. It says, truth is nowhere to be found. Whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. At this point in Israel's history, they were moral flatliners. No truth anywhere. It was really decadent. And this is what God says. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. God looks around at the lack of virtue and is displeased. Now, there's coming a stronger word. Appalled. What is he appalled at? This is what it says. He looked, and there's no one. He was, a, he, was, he was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one and was appalled that there was no one to intervene. Someone who intervened is someone who communicates on God's behalf, who encounters people on God's behalf. What God says 
in this context is, here's the problem. People are moral flatliners, and I'm displeased at that. When I'm appalled that, no one is saying what I told them to say. No one is representing what I told them to say. That's what I'm appalled at. And then he goes on. He says, so he let his own arms work salvation for him. This is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you and my words that I have put in your mouth will not depart from your mouth or from the mouths of your children. You know what God says? I am going to make sure that there are people who say my message. I'm going to bring a redeemer. Guess who the redeemer was? The one who reveals what God is like. That's Jesus. And what God says, I'm going to send, and there will always be, I don't know how many, I don't know how this all works, there will be redeemer, and the redeemer will have kids who will say the things that I'm supposed, to, that I told them to say. Why is it important that you get the message? Why? Because if you don't hear the message that has been given, you can't be who God wants you to be. It's that clear. They were moral flatliners because they didn't hear the message. Make room for the message, you know what will happen? Not fast. Slowly, you'll start to change. We were created to be changed by the truth. The Old Testament truth changes us in a skin-deep, short-lived way. You can make change happen by holding punishment over people's heads. You can't change them long-term, and you can't change their heart. But the message of the New Covenant is God puts his law in your heart, and writes in your mind, writes it on your heart. You're going to know him. He will be helios to your righteousnesses and, and he'll remember your sins no more. Um, Paul understood because he was a servant of Christ and a steward of mysteries. As I said, we're at communion now, and we're going to experience that. At some point, I'm going to ask you to go. And I want you to think about the message. And what the message is, it is the message of reconciliation. This changing of a relationship of enmity and hostility to one of peace and goodwill. God does love you. And make room for that. Consider it. You hear other things, try to make, try to push them aside. Find a place that tries to get the message right, that cares about the message more than anything, more than the programs, more than anything. Go to a place that gets the message right. And that will ultimately end up promoting transformation. So we're going to have some music. Go get the elements and at some point um, take them and think about Jesus and the message that he came to proclaim. <laughs>